starting off, you've been state superintendent for four years already. How do you view the role of the department which you oversee? Is it providing support to schools or is it holding them in compliance or a mixture of both? So I really feel that um, the voters hired me to do a mixture of both. Um, I'm responsible for making sure that we're providing improvement to schools, uh, resources for school improvement, uh, which is one of the reasons that I reorganized the Department of Education to actually form outreach for school improvement. So um, as you know, we have uh, coordinators all around the state of Indiana uh, that know every principal in the region in which they serve. Uh, we hire them from the communities in which they're going to serve, so they have a vested interest in the communities and the improvement of the schools. Uh, in addition to that, uh, under a federal mandate, when we take federal dollars, uh, we do have to make sure that we're monitoring uh, the use of those dollars uh, for the improvement of schools. And so what have you learned the last four years that would change how you would do your job if you are reelected going into your next year? So through the outreach for school improvement, uh, we've been able to turn around literally 193 schools from low performing to high performing, Im impacting over 108,000 students. Um, so going forward, uh, we are going to be expanding outreach and we've been expanding it every single year. Uh, those figures that I gave you are really just two years of data. Uh, we're getting ready to have our third year. Um, but we've already expanded to what we would call systems of care. Uh, so I hired my first person uh, to oversee this work, making sure kids have wraparound services um, provided to them. Um, and in working with WFYI, we had produced the state of the classroom. Um, and so it's an extension of all of those wraparound services that are provided to children, not just in after school programs, but now we're really talking about state programs, um, mental health health for children um, and all of those services. So we're beginning our work in Austin, Indiana, uh, where they had the HIV breakout. And uh, it's uh, very successful in gathering together the local supports as well as breaking down the barriers uh, for the state resources. So after talking with Jennifer McCormick, your opponent, um, we, you know, after talking about issues and all of the things she mentioned, I think, you know, Superintendent Ritz and I, are on the same page with a lot of those things. I think the difference will come down to how we would run the department. And so from your point of view, what do you see as the differences between your opponents? So we've actually broken down the silos um, of, of, of working with schools. So we don't have what I would call such individual uh, divisions at the department anymore doing their own individual things. Um, when we bring support to a school district, we gather all the department divisions together uh, to have a holistic approach to serving children. Children. Um, the entire um, department is really focused on school improvement. Um, we got together and, and decided our mission was going to be to build an education system of equity and high quality focused on student-centered accountability. It's about student needs, what resources need to come to bear. Um, I don't care where children go to school in Indiana. I don't care their zip code. Um, I want to make sure they have equity and resources and opportunities available to them. It needs to be of high quality and it needs to be about each individual child. Um, so in, in overseeing the Department of Education, uh, that's the approach we take uh, really every day, uh, whether it be communication out to the field, whether it be working with one particular uh, issue out in, the out, out in the field, whether it be me traveling two to three days a week around the state of Indiana to actually see the needs firsthand, uh, whether it be outreach coordinators bringing back concerns and issues back to the department uh, so that we can address them, um, a myriad of things that go on within the department to make sure we're supporting kids. So how do you think you differ from Jennifer McCormick and how you would Well, that's that? how I run the department. Okay. So I don't have a vision of how she's running the department. That's how I'm running the department, uh, with a total focus on what it is that we actually do for children uh, with that outreach kind of approach to make sure that we are at that very, very grassroots level uh, to make sure that it happens. So during your 2012 campaign, I think a huge poll for voters that we saw was that you were an educator and you were coming from a school, especially compared to the previous administrations. So this race, we have two people who work in school districts. What do you want voters to know about you two, knowing that you both come from an education background and not a political background? What, what sets you apart? Well, I think what sets me apart is that I've always been involved in education policy work. Uh, so from the very beginning of my teaching career at the school or the district or the state, or even at the national level, because I'm a national board certified teacher and I've served 
served on that board of directors at the national level for seven years. Um, I bring, um, I brought to the to the job in 2013 um, the policy work that I've always done. So I've always lobbied at the state house on behalf of policy um, going in a good direction for individual children. Uh, I've always talked with the legislators. I've always uh, te I've testified in front of the state board of education many times on a variety of topics, um, making sure um, that I was always in the know on how policy was affecting work in our classroom. Um, in 2011, I actually had the opportunity to even work behind the scenes, uh, working with uh, um, Senator Cruz and Representative Boehning uh, regarding teacher evaluation um, bill that was going through. Actually seeing how language actually goes through the entire process and actually is um, making that happen. So I feel I have a, a, a really good expertise in working with individuals when it comes to moving policy um, and bringing that information strand to individuals so they can make informed decisions. Uh, I meet I meet one on one so many times with legislators and I and my my uh, approach is usually the same it, it, it's here's information I want to share with this with you did you know this was happening um, are you aware of this information over here um, because I want you to be informed when it comes to a vote uh, regarding public education so speaking of politics uh, and the different politicians we've seen because you ran as a Democrat and this is the first time your position has had that in a while, we've seen a lot of politics play out, whether it was with the State Board of Education, the governor's office, or the legislature. How do you think it affected your job this first term? So yes, there were, you know, a lot of politics was going on, um, but you know, I, I figured out really quickly, I didn't need anybody's permission at the state house to serve children. Uh, so my focus really has been on serving the children, um, putting those school improvement pieces in place, making sure that we were having better schools, making sure that resources were getting where they need to go. Um, and the politics is really sometimes just the politics. Um, and I have work to do. So I've been focused on the work of doing what it is that we need to get done. And so, uh, you know, that's, I can give you one really quick example mm -hmm. though, you know, which would be pre-K. Uh, most people really don't know the real pre-K story. Um, so in 2013, um, I had the opportunity to, for the U.S. Department of Education to submit a grant. Um, and I need Governor Pence's uh, signature to write the grant and to submit it, and we did. Um, and we had a vested interest in moving forward with pre-K. At the department, we kind of knew we might not get that grant because we didn't have what we call in Indiana an infrastructure for pre-K, that you know, having educational programming for four-year-olds as opposed to daycare. Um, so we didn't get the grant, but then the U.S. Department turned around and said, you know, there's a handful of states that don't have infrastructure. We want to give you a special grant. Um, and so it was $80 million over four years, and the governor signed it for us to write it, um, and instead of signing it for submission, um, he said, an email that said we were not going to be submitting for federal dollars. But what Indiana got instead was, you know, a, a pilot program for 1,500 children. Um, and that's not where we needed to be. So I proceeded at the department. Uh, we now have standards in place, both private and public um, um, day, um, programs are utilizing that kind of funding, uh, for, I mean, that kind of standards for their pre-K programming, as well as making sure that we were building up the quality level of all of the pre-Ks, working with the FSSA, working with the ELAC committee, making sure that that was going in a good direction. Um, so the politics entered, um, but it didn't deter my work. Um, I'm very focused on what it is we knew, need to do for children, and that is always, always where I am. But there's limits, so I mean, eighty million dollars would have been nice, you know. So politics did prevent a certain forward mobility. Um, you can't write legislation or pass. Le I mean, you can write legislation. You can't pass legislation. Um, you just have to work with what you've got. And so, when it comes to things like vouchers and school choice and school funding, that really falls with the legislature. And so. You know, how have what you've learned the last four years are you going to take into this next session and hope to get more ears on what you've heard? So you, you said it right there, how you get more ears on what you've heard. And to me, that means that it's a public conversation. Um, I'm, I'm a huge believer in the public driving policy. Um, you're, you are absolutely right. Glenda Ritz, you know, can't accomplish those things. Um, it takes the General Assembly to be sure to do that. It takes a governor that believes in public education to move the conversation forward. Um, I, can, I can be a spokesperson or I can say here's how I think we should go. But in the end, you're absolutely right. It's a public conversation uh, to bring to the ears of those that serve us to, to move policy along. And I, I work with all constituencies to be sure that, that's, that that 
public conversation is out there for everybody to be involved. So since 2012, I'll say, because that was kind of the beginning of some big changes here when it comes to education, we've seen um, our testing system change, our standards change, the accountability system has been adjusted, and now we have these federal guidelines under the No Child Left Behind rewrite. Um, I know a lot of schools and teachers have felt frustrated with the back and forth, um, and it seems we're, you know, you're hosting this, or you're a part of this ISTEP panel to make some more tweaks. Um, you know, do you think it's necessary to keep changing things as much as we are when it comes to education policy and implementation? And what's your vision for that? Over the next so we years? always should be moving forward with mm -hmm. what we would call good policy decisions. They're going to affect what happens right in the classroom. So I'm actually here as the superintendent because of testing. Um, literally, um, a little third grader came to my, my library um, after the, we gave the I Read 3 test for the first time, very high stakes test, um, and said, Mrs. Ritz, I don't need to check out a book today because I just did well on my, on my I Read 3 test. And I said to myself, what are we doing to the children where they think the act of reading is dependent upon a test in some way? Because that's not true. The act of reading is a lifelong skill all the time. Um, and we don't want to be giving the impression to our children that, you know, you do this for a test and then you're okay and you do it for a test and then you're okay. Um, testing, um, standards, and the accountability system, the high stakesness of the accountability system in Indiana. Um, I think legislators recognized that we needed to move forward with a fair accountability system and we have one. I am very excited about that. Um, standards needed, needed to be looked at because we were remediating students to the tune of 35 to 40 million dollars a year in mathematics. We needed to align our mathematics work with what we do in the classroom. Um, the standards are in place now and so is the accountability system. And the last piece is testing. Um, let's, let's, let's streamline the entire assessment system. Let's make sure that we're looking at the high stakes that are attached to it um, and how is it that we need to move that conversation. I really feel strongly that despite changes that have been happening over the last several years, Educators have a sense that we're headed in the right direction, uh, that the standards are no longer teach the, to the test standards. They're looking for proficient readers and writers and communicators and problem solvers, uh, opening up the actual work that you do in the classroom with kids, getting kids engaged in reading and writing and, and all, of the, all of the things that you need to be engaged in to really be a great learner. Um, and then making sure that we're always moving forward in that direction. We have to talk about the high stakes. Uh, I think the field is really wanting to see changes in that area, whether it be you know, the, the students scores attached to the teacher's um, compensation and evaluation, whether it be what is it the grades that we assign to our schools, um, and is that is that interfering with what it is that we're doing to be sure that we're improving schools. Uh, the federal government began the accountability system to improve schools. You know, we want you to be accountable to improve schools. That's my job. Uh, that's the job of the department to be sure that we're, we're providing the resources to actually make sure we really are improving schools. So talking about ESSA is kind of the next big nut to crack in terms of how we move forward. And um, I interviewed a lot of superintendents before today to kind of take their temperature from across the state. And a lot seemed a little concerned about guidance and when that's going to come down and the process of figuring it out. And so what would you say to people who are concerned about, who are sitting back being like, how are we holding my students accountable? Well, I would say that under ESSA, we don't have all the final rules yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they should be concerned, as I am concerned, quite frankly, about transition to whatever it is we're going to implement. Uh, but all states are embracing the flexibility, uh, especially in the areas of assessment, uh, looking at our accountability system, putting in more measures other than the test score. Those things are exciting uh, to be sure that we're going to do that kind of work. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're having a good transition. I am very sensitive to all the change that has been happening. Um, and, and quite frankly, you know, the federal government's been in charge of a great deal of that. Uh, just our last assessment, you know, we were required to implement a year before we were ready to implement. We had a whole a transition plan plan uh, for that kind of work. Um, so yes, it, there's a lot of change that has been going on both at the state and the federal level. Um, um, and we need to be taking a look at what we want to do in Indiana to reduce the high stakes of what it is we're doing. Um, actually focus on the needs of children and how can our, how can our ESSA plan um, focus on that and the improvement of schools. Uh, we really are writing another 
plan, uh, as we have done at the department the last two times. The la they were waivers, they were called waivers, but we're really submitting a new plan. And so with that, we want to make sure it's going to head us in a good direction and um, make sure that uh, we are reducing the high stakes of what we feel in the classroom and, and really be about student learning. Do you think the amount of change that teachers have experienced the last four to five years is slowing down going forward? It, it is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, the standards are established. The accountability system is set. Uh, we're going to reduce the testing uh, of what it is we're doing with our children and streamline that. Uh, but I think they're going to feel a lot of relief. Uh, my current plan that, I, that I'll be uh, bringing to the committee uh, reduces time for students eight hours worth of testing that we'll reduce and $12 million worth of cost. Um, and we, could, we can reduce even more than that if the, if the panel wants to move in that direction. Um, so I'm looking forward to really having all three systems that we live under uh, and breathe and, and, and educate under, uh, which are standards, accountability, and assessment. Um, they will all be where they need to be. It's going to start um, feeling like, yes, we're here. Uh, let us teach as we know we need to do in our classrooms um, and a lot more learning going on for our kids. Whoever's elected will have to hit the ground running because the legislative session starts in January um, and it is a budget session so school funding could be on the table. Is what are your thoughts if you are reelected going into the session? What would you want to talk to legislators about regarding our school? So I've already submitted my budget. I had to do that in August uh, to the Department of Administration. So uh, with that, um, I've, I've asked for 2% over each of the years of the biennium for our schools. Uh, I want to reinstitute the small uh, schools um, line item within the budget because our rural schools are really getting hit uh, with not only property tax changes but but just funding in general and then uh, I have uh, many items within different budget items that affect technology uh, that's a large equity piece that we really need to address I go to schools that have one-to-one -one technology for their children and instant access to the internet and then I go to schools who barely have a computer lab that the kids can get into once once a week um, we're in the 21st century learning we absolutely absolutely have to have our children equipped to infuse technology within what they do uh, when they leave our high schools. Uh, so I have, I have technology pieces built within too. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, a good robust plan. Uh, there are uh, other items that I want to make sure that we're putting in place to be sure kids get what they need. So when talking about testing, educators all over the state will say, we want those results back immediately. Immediately, absolutely. But part of that has to be with technology. You can't grade a paper and pencil <laughs> test within a week. And so do you think it's plausible to get enough funding to make sure every school is on the same level with technology to get them those results that they want? So. I'm, I'm always been an advocate for the flexibility that the ESSA is now affording us, and that's the use of computer adaptive testing. Uh, and I want to see that kind of testing happen in our classrooms within our system. It individualizes the approach for the child. And in really simple terms, instead of children all taking the same test and the same questions at the same time on a pass-fail approach, it individualizes for the child. So it, it actually, you know, if a child gets a question right in reading, then he goes to a harder question. If he, if he, if he gets it wrong, he goes to a next uh, lower question. And it starts saying, you know, here's Johnny's reading level. I um, mean, here's what we know about Johnny and reading. Um, and giving us that individualized information. Those types of assessments go on in our classrooms all the time. Um, they have pretty easy access to, to the internet utilizing that type of technology. Um, all the children aren't taking the same questions at the same time. You can get immediate feedback. You do not have to wait for all of these scores to be, to be processed. Um, you know, I think the combination of using a computer adaptive um, and then having making sure you do have some writing samples but making sure that you're going to be able to you know actually turn around those writing samples and, and recheck all of them as opposed to the process the long laborious process that we have now I couldn't agree more that our I step process that we have now is laborious um, to not only give and administer and prep for, um, and we already know how the children are going to perform on it before we ever give it. Um, but we also have a laborious process after it's finished um, because of the type of test that we've chosen to give. Um, and S is giving us, uh, you know, an opportunity to have a different approach to assessment, and I want to take advantage of it. So these computer adaptive tests—that's what a lot of some people have been saying. We can't, we don't want to do that, or because it's throughout the year, or you know. As it does require it to be a summative test, correct? 
So there are two ways now in mm -hmm. which we can get a summative score. Mm -hmm. um, so we can either add up some scores throughout a school year and say here's your score or we can actually have it at the end and here's your test and here's your score. Uh, even using computer adaptive there are a couple approaches that you can take with that. Um, so you could you could have um, the first, you know, like the fall and the winter, um, give you more what we call formative information. A teacher would say, you know, knowing knowing how Johnny is working and moving along. Um, and then the last se session could still be computer adaptive, but have embedded within that the questions that we need to actually get a summative score. Or you could kind of embed the questions along the way and they add up. So we have the opportunity. Um, it, it's not dependent upon using a computer adaptive test, mm -hmm. but we have two different approaches now that the federal government is saying that we can use. But do you think the schools have the infrastructure to get those quick results? Because in my head you would need... I do. Okay. I also have proposed in my budget that the mm -hmm. testing line item actually be comprised of two components. So not only the test administration, but the technology to make sure that every school does have what they need. So yes, I, I told you I had three different areas within my budget that included technology and one of those areas is testing. Okay, and um, last question, after talking to superintendents about their relationships with the Department of Education and various mm -hmm. staff, the number one complaint I heard was that communication isn't as frequent or timely when it comes to big things. And so as the head of the department, what's your response to that? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by big things. It probably is testing. Testing, ether upgrades. <laughs> probably testing and A to F grades. Yes. And as I explained already, that's a very laborious process. Um, I'm actually dedicated. Um, the stakes are so high mm -hmm. on these tests um, that they, they absolutely have to be right. Uh, when we release information. Um, th the worst thing that could happen is that we release information and it's not, okay? Um, so yes, it's a laborious process by which we must adhere. Um, there's no choice in the department making sure that we do that. We're dependent upon the vendor uh, that is actually administering the test. Um, you know we've gone a new vendor, so we've changed vendors as well. Um, but you know what? We communicate to the schools uh, in a weekly dialogue. Uh, I administer the DOE dialogue every single week. Uh, we have all types of um, communications that go out from my assessment and my accountability, um, p my staff, to the staff over in the schools. Uh, we get out information as soon as we can get it out um, and we've gathered the information that we need. So we want to make sure that uh, we're doing it as quickly as possibly as we possibly can and that's always uh, been the focus. I, I absolutely know as an educator I I want as much information as I can to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do with the children um, because the stakes are so high not only for my own compensation um, but for what we're doing with the schools and, and the accountability and the grading of our schools. So I'm absolutely right on knowing uh, what the needs are uh, out there in the field. Everybody wants things quicker. Everybody wants things faster. I want to make sure it's right. Uh, when I release information, it needs to be right. Um, and I'll give you a quick example, the hold harmless that we did for the schools because of the more rigorous assessment um, and making sure that that's that schools were not going to be held um, to that rigor of accountability with those grades because of the more rigorous test. That I started that process 18 months ahead. You know, here's what we kind of need to do and here's where I think we need to be. When we had all the data that we needed to have, um, then that's when I took it to the General Assembly and said, here's what we need to do and here's how it needs to be done. Uh, doing things like that prematurely, just for the sake of getting them out there, um, is, is sometimes more harmful than it is helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm always dedicated to be sure that information is accurate. Um, and I know people sometimes don't understand why there's a delay here. We've had our, step, our scores back for some time on our students. Why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? Uh, but in actuality, we have to rely upon the data to come to us from the vendor um, and make sure that it is all correct uh, before we proceed. All right. Well, thank you so much, Superintendent. You are welcome. I appreciate you sitting down. You are down. welcome. <laughs>